Very good. Uh, comrades and friends, it's great to be here today. Uh, we're going to have a chance to talk about, uh, and actually a topic that's extremely important, uh, which is uh, comrades and friends, it's great to be uh, here to content of uh, Marxism Leninism. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to uh, note something that at least I consider to be quite important, and that's the passing, uh, the untimely death of a friend of our organization and a real example of what uh, communists should be. And that's the passing of uh, Ka Fidel. And uh, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity, please uh, take a look at the tribute that we've done to him, done for him in Fight Back and the Freedom Road Socialist Organization is published. I think uh, in terms of learning what, what, it, what it is to be a real Marxist Leninist in this world today, I think we can all afford to look at his life and the example and his work and, uh, and try to take off from there. But uh, anyways, Ka Fidel, we salute you. But here we are on the topic itself, and that is what is Marxism-Leninism? And I'm gonna start from the most general, the most big picture kind of uh, approach. And then we're gonna break it down into the sum try total to take of off from there. But, uh, Stalin noted that it's a big topic. Many volumes could be written about it, but uh, I know that none of us can be here all day. It's dialectical. Every meeting has a beginning and every meeting has an end. Same applies for this. So I'm gonna to have to try to be succinct. So Marxism, Leninism, what is it? It's a science. It's the science of revolution. Society's development, all society's development are law governed processes. Processes that we can understand and actually know the laws that's guiding their development. That's historical materialism the science of society. And that's a science that we can actually learn. And again, Marxism-Leninism is a science of social change. It's a science of revolution. And by revolution, what are we talking about here too? I think that's an important question because we're not just talking about uh, our revolution in the Democratic Party or something like that. We're talking about what Mao was talking about, which is basically, it's not a dinner party. Nope, embroidery. Nope, painting a picture like the one over my head. Nope, it's not like that either. It's an act of violence where one class overthrows another. That's what we're talking about with revolution. Basically getting rid of our oppressors and people being in power. We're talking about real and fundamental change. And to do that, we need Marxism Leninism. So how does Freedom Road look at it? Look at it. I think that's an important issue. And uh, we have some unity documents. People can reference them online. Certainly worth looking at, in my opinion. And it says this, the primary theoreticians of Marxism and Leninism are Marx, no surprise there, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao. We also value the contributions of other socialists, such as Kabar, Fidel Castro, Ho Chi Minh, who applied Marxism to the conditions they found in their own countries. And we seek to learn from Marxist Leninists in the United States, figures such as William Z. Foster, due to help found the Communist Party here, or Harry Haywood, really an outstanding theoretician. And we can also learn from revolutionary nationalists such as Malcolm X. Theory derives, theory derives, very important point, from our social practice. And we seek to grow from every new lesson our activism and all social movements teach us. So there's a basic point here. And that is, uh, well, individuals such as Lenin, Marx, Stalin, Mao, yeah, very important in devi devi uh, developing the science of Marxism-Leninism. It's basically the science itself is the product of the struggle of hundreds of millions of people to liberate themselves and to smash the chains of oppression. That indeed is where Marxism-Leninism originates from. And again, it's a science. And so if you got that, you actually got a lot more than a lot of other people got when they're trying to look at it. Ah, some people think, uh, and I don't want to digress here, but it's important. Some people think uh, studying Marxism or studying Leninism or Mel Mel, it's like a Bible study. It is not Bible study. It's not memorizing a bunch of quotations and trying to throw them at the world. It's about an analytical method uh, that basically allows us to understand how society works and how to change it. So there's a methodology to it as well. It's a science. It's a real science. So let's take a look at some of the content and stuff of it. And uh, 
Actually, let me actually just stop with another definitional point, because again, I think the big picture thing is helpful when we um, are trying then go into a, a set of particulars that defined its content. But uh, generally speaking, so Marxism has been around for a while, right? 1860, I think it is, Marx, uh, actually earlier than that, 1850, uh, Marx puts together the Communist Manifesto. But it was in fact Lenin that carried forward Marxism into a new historical period. And indeed, Marxism-Leninism is the science of revolutionary revolution in the era of monopoly capitalism, i.e. imperialism. It's a historical period. It's a new and different period than the period of competitive capitalism, the period where Marx and Engels were active. And basically, Lenin was the one who dragged the science, or not dragged it, he actually advanced the science forward into, into this new period. And so it's entirely correct to say, actually, as Stalin first said, that basically Leninism is Marxism in the in era of imperialism and proletarian revolution. In his brilliant work, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, Lenin made a penetrating analysis of the conditions we were facing. And he said that monopoly capitalism is a parasitic system of exploitation and oppression that had set, extended its tentacles to every area, uh, every corner of the globe, and that it was a moribund system. And it was a system that was rent with contradictions. And specifically, Lenin looked at three big contradictions. We could actually add a fourth. Three big contradictions. One is the struggle between the different imperialist powers. Two, the struggle between labor and capital. Three, the struggle between the oppressor the nations we were facing, the big, so called advanced capitalist countries, advanced in a parasitic a system of exploitation, and the oppressed people of the world. Very important contradiction. Number three. And number four, which we can add on to that, is the contradiction between socialism and capitalism. Basically, this monopoly capitalist system is a moribund system that is racked, that is uh, basically. Um, whatever, faces these very intense uh, contradictions and stuff within it. And that's the context that Lenin developed, Leninism or Marxism-Leninism that we're talking about. So let's talk a little bit about how Lenin did that. And he wasn't alone. He was actually part of a world movement, people who are on more of the left side, if you will, of the socialist movement, who are looking to advance things. And they actually had a very difficult task in front of them. And I'm going to try to keep this simple. This is these like very... adding like a ton of historical figures to this. But uh, in the period of the late 1800s, uh, a lot of the socialist movement became increasingly conservative. And as the century turned, uh, 1900 and all that, uh, it became a bigger and bigger problem. And in the socialist movement, there was a problem of opportunism, reformism old style revisionism. And you had a lot of people in the socialist movement who just weren't revolutionaries. That's really kind of the end of the day. That's what the problem with them was. People like Kautsky, whatever, just not revolutionaries. And the task fell on Lenin and other leftists within the international socialist movement to basically clear away the trash, get rid of the garbage, and put Marxism on a revolutionary basis in this new era where monopoly capitalism reigns supreme. And that was really Lenin's uh, supreme accomplishment, was clearing away this opportunist garbage. And let me give an example of it, because I think it's still relevant today. Old revision and new revision actually has, uh, revisionism has some things in common. For example, the pernicious, actually rotten theory of a peaceful transition to socialism that somehow imperialism or the imperialists and their representatives can somehow be uh, just peacefully removed from power, either through a way the trash. or through elections or something like that. No, we need a revolution. And Lenin was, uh, was very, very clear on that. And that's something that we still argue with and debate with people today. We got people running around out there uh, who are reformists. In fact, they're socialists. Socialists, S-L-O-W-I-S-H, you know, whatever, socialists. They think to them, socialism is just an accumulation of reforms. Thus, it's not just a accumulation of reforms. We do fight for reforms, that's true. But it's not, socialism is not, it's a leap. It's a transition from the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, which is what we live under, a dictatorship of the monopoly capitalists, 
to the dictatorship of the working class of the proletariat. Core component of Leninism, just hit on it right there. The D of the P, the dictatorship of the proletariat. What do we aim to deal with in terms of the monopoly capitalists? You look, uh, monopoly capitalists, we aim to replace them with proletarian political power. And that's an aim that we have. I'm frozen. I'm stuck in time. Uh, and indeed, that is tragic. Is my voice fro frozen as well, or is it simply? Well, uh, hopefully it's uh, frozen in a, in a manner that's uh, pleasing uh, uh, to uh, those who are uh, those who are uh, watching this event, because uh, I'm going to proceed frozen or not. And there's nothing that I think that uh, uh, I can automatically, uh, I have an animated style, I hope, but um, is it still frozen? Um, uh, I will continue with, the, <laughs> I will continue with just my voice and hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully, I suspect it's a problem with the internet connection, and uh, uh, a brilliant technician is working with me well, right right now to uh, to help uh, help fix the problem if it can be fixed. So, anyways, we were talking about the the content of uh, Marxism Leninism and some of its important features, and I started with one. Uh, which was the issue of replacing the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, which is what we live under. And Lenin was remarkably clear about this as too. You know, number one, you can take a look at his book, for example, The State and Revolution, or The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky, two brilliant Marxist works that I think anyone who aspires to be a real and revolutionary socialist should look at. And you find these concepts being referred to again and again and again. And it's actually kind of a natural and normal thing. Because again, Lenin was operating in the period of monopoly capitalism, imperialism, where this issue of revolution appears on the agenda on a world scale. In the developing world, in the advanced capitalist countries, monopoly capitalism is a moribund dying system. And it's our job to basically put a stake through the vampire's heart. And that's what we're going to do. And that's what's taking place in a number. It's already happened in a number of countries. And it's going to happen in more. So we have the concept in Leninism of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Well, how are we going to get there? And Lenin actually addressed that with a huge amount of clarity. And I'm going to talk about both in terms of particularly how that would apply to the United States, but also I'd like to address some issues on a world scale and kind of come back to some particulars. So, you know, one of the biggest problems that uh, Lenin faced um, as a young person uh, and it was simply, similarly, it was faced by Mao, but it's been faced by uh, revolutionaries in many, many, many places, um, is that there was a certain separation, if you will, between the socialist movement, which often tended to be young people, maybe out of school, young intellectuals, and the workers' movement on the other hand, and that there was a task of bringing the two together. And Lenin's book, What is to be Done? I advise everyone to read it but it has a lot in it. But one of the most important points he's addressing is some of the particulars in Russia at a time of an upsurge to the working class movement, how to address the issue of fusing Marxism, Marxism with the workers' movement. And his basic point in the book was that uh, uh, we can't just uh, trail after where people are at. We have to be willing to teach them something. That's what people are actually interested in, or a thing that people are interested in. How the hell can we get out of this mess that we're in? And as revolutionaries, we have our we have that job in front of us to be teaching people that, and we're going to. And that was the point that Lenin was making in the book. What is to be done? That basically, what we need to do is, um, uh, anyways, we're dealing with the technical problems again. Uh, but uh, what we need to do is fuse Marxism and, uh, and the workers' movement. And in that process, we need to build a political party of a new type. That's another key point in what is to be done, and it's another key point in Leninism. Now, those old-scale parties of the Second International, those things in the 1800s, whatnot, they were reformist parties. They were electoral parties that were hoping to vote themselves, by and large, into power. Not everybody was like that, but many were. 
And Lenin comes along and says, no, we need a political party that's an instrument, that's a tool of revolution. Basically, it's an embodiment of revolutionary consciousness that can interact with the objective situation, subjective and objective kind of thing. And that's what Lenin is advocating. We need a party that's basically, number one, a tool of revolution. And upon seizing power, can organize basically the proletarian dictatorship socialism, be the chief organizer of a socialist society. So Lenin is very, very clear on these concepts. And these are all core and fundamental concepts of Leninism, the science of Leninism. So let's take a look at this a little bit. Uh, we can actually compare and contrast too on the world scale. Um, and uh, so we have um, one second, I'm looking to see if there's any questions here to me to maybe address the point, am I still frozen? The voice, the voice is great. So apparently, nothing, uh, not, nothing is to be done. Nothing is to be done about it. So I'll have to uh, uh, an animate my voice further uh, to conv convey these lively points, uh, lively points to the best of my ability. But on a world scale, uh, Leninism took uh, a look at uh, two very important questions. In addition, as strategic questions of revolution. And they were number one, the peasant question, and number two, the national question. Um, and the peasant question, people might go, what the, what the hell are we talking about there? You know, and well, what we're talking about is the fact that even in the world today, about half the folks live in rural areas, many of them farm for a living. And many of them, for many of them, the issue of land tenure, i.e. Who holds, who holds the land, who holds the power in the countryside is a very, very important question. And Lenin uh, correctly said that the agrarian revolution in the developing world, actually in Europe too, could be harnessed, could become part and parcel of the world struggle, the world proletarian struggle for change. And uh, so Lenin was seeing a united front between workers and peasants, workers and farmers on a world scale. And this was an extremely important point. And there's a point that's actually closely related to this. And uh, it, it has extreme importance today. And that is Lenin's thinking on the national question. And in the old days, in Lenin's day, it was like an intense uh, question of intense debate. What importance does it have, if any? And Lenin said, well, hey, it's really important. Most people in the world today, this is Lenin's time, but it's also actually largely true today. Most people in the world are in nations that are oppressed by imperialists. It has extreme. In Lenin's time, of course, it was colonialism, monopoly capitalism, but with the colonial character today as a neo-colonial character like exists in the Philippines. Important point. But Lenin looked at this and said, this is actually a weak point, a weak point of imperialism and actually a crucial thing to imperialism's destruction. That the uh, people in the oppressed countries by rising up will weaken the imperialist system. In those impressed countries, uh, it's important that communist parties develop, are led by the working class there and can, can transition those societies in a socialist direction and basically have a breakthrough at the weak link. And this weak link thing is important too. And I don't want to just go uh, jumping from point to point, but uh, Leninism is a big topic, as Stalin correctly noted. So let's talk about imperialism a little bit more and the national question and the issue of the weakest link, because it's an important point. It's actually a fundamental point. So imperialism develops unevenly. Not the same everywhere, but it develops unevenly. One of the things this leads to is actually war between imperialist powers, the imperialist powers that actually control more stuff and those that want to get that stuff. That's one of the things that leads to imperialist war. But it also means imperialist power is different and the contradictions are different in different parts of the developing world. And at places where the links are the weakest, such as China in the 1940s, huge breakthroughs can be made. And such things are to be welcomed. And Lenin was arguing with a lot of people who said, really, the colonial struggle don't make any difference to us, one way or the other. They're somehow lesser, it's somehow lesser important Lenin said, not only is it uh, equally important, but it might well be more important. 
He wrote a very important article on the topic called uh, Backward Europe and Advanced Asia. And what he was doing is contrasting in those two articles and those two, yeah, they were articles, they weren't books, in those two articles, the level of development of the struggle in those two places and saying that he felt, and he was correct about this, that uh, indeed it was very possible in the developing world, the world that was oppressed by imperialism, that the greatest possible blows, the greatest possible steps towards human freedom could be made. Very important contribution on the part of Lenin, again, a very important core concept of Leninism. So let me just recount some of the points that I've covered, and then I'm going to maybe cover a few more, or maybe uh, we're going to take some questions. But first of all, I just want to recount what I've covered. Number one, Marxism, Marxism-Leninism is a science. It's a science, just like biology, chemistry, etc. Number two, it's the science of revolution. And revolution is the way out for the oppressed, and that includes the oppressed in the United States, uh, for the working class here. Revolution is the way out. Number, th number three, uh, what are we trying to do? We're trying to move from capitalism to socialism. Monopoly capitalism is a failed system. Here we have a political representative like Donald Trump. That's a political, that's actually an outstanding representative for a, a failed political system. And whoever replaces him, uh, my guess, he'll be a failure too. But that's, uh, that's probably another story for another, uh, another event. So anyways, we're trying to move from monopoly capitalism to socialism and to replace the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, this cash register so-called democracy, with basically the rule of the working class, the dictatorship of the proletariat. To do that, we need to uh, have a plan and we need to have an instrument to do that, which is a political party. Communist Party, a new Communist Party, which is what we're trying to build in Freedom Road. We're trying to develop that political party. And finally, there's the issue of um, some of the core components. And I talked about the peasant question, the issue of uh, land to the tiller. We could kind of go into its development again. Huge question at the time uh, when Lenin was writing, again, most people in the world were peasants. That's really what most people in the world did. And uh, just because those of us who are uh, viewing this today uh, are in cities, overwhelmingly, uh, we should never forget that uh, if you travel out in the world at large, you know, be it in India, uh, Philippines, whatnot, that many, many of us in the world today are, are still tied to the land and the issue of what takes place on the land is a huge question. And there's also the issue of the national question. And it occurs to me there's a few more things I would like to say about it before I move towards, move towards wrapping, it, wrapping it up, which is that uh, Lenin's thinking on the national question was a sharp break, uh, number one, uh, from the reformists of the Second International, from those more conservative socialist elements that were in the world movement at the time. Uh, number one, because he viewed it as extremely important and number two is that uh, he had a revolutionary approach to the matter, a matter, uh, an approach that essentially was consistent democracy. And what do we mean by consistent democracy? Well, we mean if one can do it, the other can. And one of the core demands, one of the core issues of oppressed nations is the right of self-determination, the right of separation the right to leave a political, uh, political bound. Nobody who's uh, a prisoner is not free. If you can't leave, if you can't determine your own destiny, if you can't decide to be a separate political entity, uh, you cannot be free. And that's the essence of what self-determination is. It's the right to leave. Compare, compare it, if you will, to the right to divorce. You know, people, if, if you don't have the right to leave, you know, whatever, you need the right to divorce. You know, it doesn't mean everybody needs to be divorced. Self-determination does mean at its core, the right to leave, the right to separation. In fact, uh, uh, Lenin wrote a great book called The uh, Right to Self-Determination Summed Up. And uh, he says at one point, he says, let's replace this uh, uh, right to uh, self-determination with the right to separation. He said, that'll make it more clear to people. So anyways, I think that uh, I advise people uh, uh, to read this kind of thing. And also it has an application uh, uh, in the United States as well. The United States is a prison house. 
of nations. It's a prison house for the oppressed. And if anything, uh, that this rebellion that's uh, actually in some ways still underway, but uh, flared with a remarkable intensity uh, here in Minneapolis a couple of months ago, is that many people, many of the oppressed, want to break out of this uh, jailhouse of nations, so to speak. I can talk a little bit about what is a nation and that kind of thing. I don't necessarily know that it's that important to what we're doing here today, but uh, I certainly can. So in any event, I think in many ways, I've summed up some of the biggest uh, tenets, if you will, or pillars of uh, Marxism-Leninism, kind of six of them. Uh, I certainly could talk about other things, uh, uh, including the issue of war and peace. But I'd like to sum up or draw things to a conclusion by saying this, and I think this is really, in my opinion, the core of Marxism-Leninism, which is that uh, uh, above all else, Leninism is revolutionary. Uh, it looks to destroy, to demolish the existing order of things and replace it with socialism. That is the core. The core message of Lenin is to be a revolutionary. And that's our approach to this. Do we fight for reforms? Absolutely. Uh, we want things to be better, uh, even as society is actually uh, getting worse for folks. Uh, but we, we fight to make things better. We also understand that uh, change is made by the masses of people. Part of the way you get people coming with you is by fighting for these reforms. It's part of the process of accumulating forces. And we're interested in that too. So in any event, uh, be a revolutionary, uh, take up Marxism-Leninism. We have an extraordinarily uh, bright future uh, ahead of us. And uh, I'm confident that we will get there. So thank you. Oh, I do. All right. And am I, I, I just have to ask the question. I, so when I look at myself, I'm seeing somebody waving their hands and everything else. Am I still frozen? Oh, all right. Well, whatever. Um, next, next time uh, I'll do better. So the first question is, um, uh, what books should I start reading to learn uh, about Marxism and Leninism? Uh, well, I would suggest um, uh, a couple of books that I think are uh, great summations. Uh, one is, is uh, the history of the Communist Party Soviet Union, which is a history, but it also uh, takes the time to lay out basically organizationally, politically, and ideologically the key components of Leninism. I can cite the chapters, but I, I can't cite them because I don't have the book in front of me. But uh, I think that that's actually a great work uh, for kind of looking at Marxism, Leninism as a whole. I also have to recommend uh, Stalin's Foundations of Leninism. It's a brilliant uh, sum up uh, of the science. Um, and it's a science that, um, again, the more, the more you know, the better you're going to be served. In my opinion, if you want to be a doctor, for example, um, uh, you should study a little bit before you start cutting open somebody's chest. You know, likewise, we're trying to you know change society. We uh, we we do well to learn. So that's uh, that's a couple of books I could uh, recommend. There's others too. Um, so, for for example, if one was uh, studying historical materialism, I would certainly recommend uh, Maurice Cornforth. Uh, the person was a genius as far as I'm concerned. But uh, anyways, so do I think, uh, do you think the ruling class benefits from uh, Trump being president? And uh, uh, I certainly think they do and they don't. And uh, in my opinion, and uh, in what way do they? I, I think Trump has brought them all sorts of short-term gains and capitalism is a system that is actually remarkably consistent in the sense that it's very interested in uh, what can I get right now? How can I stuff my pockets this second? Capitalism uh, is a very short-sighted system. And I think Trump is a very good uh, servant of a short-sighted system. Uh, do I think uh, the ruling class benefits strategically from him being president? I think absolutely not. Um, I think he has uh, dismantled uh, the imperialist architecture erected after World War II at great expense and time to the imperialists. You know, just to take an example, uh, 
uh, Trump has stopped the WTO from functioning, which is an institution that served at its core American imperialism. So I think strategically, uh, it's not uh, a particularly good uh, deal for the imperialists, but again, short term tax breaks, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, it's all good while the money's coming in, but now that there's a crisis and a pandemic uh, and some cities are burning, I'm not sure they're looking at things the same way. So we'll see. Uh, uh, one of the things, uh, uh, you know, Marxism is a science, but it's not mind reading. So I, I can't look into the heads of uh, the ruling, all the ruling class. I can look at what they write in journals and that kind of thing. Uh, international movements that we should take inspiration from. Well, I think, uh, I think there's all sorts of movements that we can take inspiration from. And uh, I would kind of draw some uh, uh, distinctions because uh, uh, some are close. Uh, distinctions. And so uh, there's some that uh, stand out really for uh, their importance and success. And right there, I would say we can certainly all be inspired by what's taking the revolutionary process, national democratic revolutionary. It's extremely uh, inspiring. Likewise, the existence of working class uh, power in, in Cuba against really incredible odds. It's another place that we can draw uh, inspiration. They're uh, uh, extremely important because uh, both point to the fact that uh, the present, uh, the system of oppression that exists is not immutable. We can change things. So I'm very interested in the idea that there are socialist countries in the world today. And certainly that's something we can draw inspiration from. But likewise, there's movements like the Philippines that I think uh, very important that, uh, that we study, understand, and stand in solidarity with. Um, they are an example of uh, people creatively applying Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought as well, uh, to the conditions they face, making real progress. And it's an incredibly important struggle in the effort to weaken uh, imperialism, something that uh, we certainly are interested in doing. Also, I think uh, only the most hard-hearted hard, hard -hearted person in the world couldn't be uh, inspired by the resistance in Palestine. Uh, really, uh, the, the, ch the children there uh, are, even, uh, are inspirational. It's uh, whatever. There's a lot to draw inspiration from in the world today, and there's a lot to learn from. All right, during this uh, time of uprising, a lot of people are being uh, are becoming more interested in revolutionary ideology. What would you say are some good ways to win people over to ML? Uh, and uh, what what are some of the challenges? So this is a, another question that's being posed to me. Uh, well, I think in terms of uh, uh, winning people over, there's a couple of ways of approaching it. Uh, one is that. Uh, in our practical work, we need to work shoulder to shoulder uh, with the advanced, with the most active, and help raise the general level of understanding. We learn from them, by the way, as they learn from us. But uh, 